Hello, good evening. My name is Ulf Bodichtel. Um, I'm from Germany. I'm a neurologist and work at the Bavaria Clinic in Kreischer. I welcome you to the session number 16, Enhancing Recovery from Sepsis. Um, this sepsis has been sponsored by the clinic Bavaria and Kreischer, where I work. And uh, we have six speakers in this session. And first of all, I would like to introduce you Dennis Kredler. He is from Belgium and uh, he will speak to us as a patient. He survived pneumonia-related sepsis uh, in, in spring 2016 and suffered permanent physical damage. And after one year, he was able to return fully to work. And we are very interested in your experiences, Dennis. Thank you very much. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, I am um, very honored to be able to speak here uh, as a sepsis survivor to um, share a bit of a patient perspective. Um, in fact, if everything had happened as normal, I would actually not be here today. Um, I would probably be dead. Uh, in fact, I was very lucky. Um, my wife would have found me dead uh, in bed uh, coming home from work. And it was just really pure luck that she decided to come home early from work to check on me. Uh, we were able to call the ambulance just in time. But even so, I would have actually died normally in, in hospital. The first hospital was going to transfer me um, to uh, another hospital, which wouldn't have had the equipment to save me. And it was just, again, really pure luck that my wife remembered that we had a distant acquaintance who was a doctor. We didn't know then that he was exactly the right kind of doctor. And again, we were very lucky to find out that when she called him, um, that uh, he was an, uh, an ICU, an, an intensive care doctor. And it was, again, luck that he picked up his personal phone while he was on duty. And thanks to him, I ended up in the right hospital, in a university hospital, uh, by which time I was already in a coma. Um, so overall, I was already very lucky that I survived, but I got even luckier um, than that because while they were fighting to save my life, the emergency team almost decided to cut off my leg uh, to save the rest of me. And only one doctor stopped this. And I was very lucky that he was on duty that night. He wasn't sure if he could save my leg, but in the end he did. And I was very lucky that he dared to speak up against the majority of the doctors and that he took that risk. In the end, I spent one week in a coma, five weeks in intensive care, eight months in hospital and rehabilitation, and I lost half my left foot. I'm extremely grateful, obviously, to everyone who was involved, and I realized that I was very, very lucky. And many people are quite simply not that lucky. Um, and frankly, uh, needing so much luck to make it through as I did is just really not good enough. Um, my condition should have been spotted by a doctor that came to see me one day before all this happened. She didn't spot that I had pneumonia. I could have probably had a blood test, taken antibiotics, and most likely none of this would have actually happened. I now know that 700,000 Europeans alone die from sepsis each year. Many of the more than 2.5 million survivors, of which I'm one, come away with some kind of lasting condition that not only affects their quality of life, but that also puts a really continuing financial strain on the health system. My sepsis treatment cost around 200,000 euros to the health insurance system. And I'm still recovering now, two and a half years later. The cost obviously continues to accumulate. And there's absolutely no certainty as to when or whether indeed ever the recovery will be complete. I am now um, speaking a lot about my experience in the hope that it helps to show what has to be achieved. Every part of the chain from the would-be patient and the family, so really anyone, uh, via the general family doctor to the emergency department and the intensive care unit, all of these 
um, parts of the chain have to be aware of sepsis, the symptoms, how to determine very quickly whether a patient has sepsis and how to react to it, um, which is why this uh, Congress is such an important part um, of, of that endeavor. The first time that I heard about sepsis was when I woke up from my coma. Most people I speak to today still have never heard of it. Um, and so uh, we really see that there is a lot of work to be done to ensure that family doctors need to be better equipped to take blood samples, analyze them quickly. Hospitals need to be set up to transfer patients fast if they see they're not equipped to save the patient. Survival shouldn't depend on luck. And that's where public policy can play a role. There is a World Health Organization requirement for national governments around the world to deliver national sepsis action plans. There is an opportunity to embed these in national infection management plans very often. So there is a real opportunity to act and to put sepsis um, into the focus of health policies and really make a difference. And that's where sepsis survivors come in. Um, the, 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 the more of us are comfortable to speak up and highlight our experience of sepsis, the more obvious it will have to be that sepsis isn't really all that rare. And a focus on the, on the often very difficult, long and incomplete recovery path can help further focus action uh, here. So we can help bring sepsis into the spotlight, and that's going to lead to more awareness uh, amongst the public, uh, amongst policymakers, and hopefully foster change, both on prevention and on support for recovery. The Global Sepsis Alliance is a great platform I found to help raise awareness, and I can only appeal to any sepsis survivor, uh, whether you're still in recovery or not, to get involved if you feel comfortable, share your story and help uh, bring sepsis into the spotlight um, that, it, uh, that it deserves. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, uh, Dennis, for your perspective of uh, your experience. Um, does anyone from the audience have a question to uh, Dennis Cradler? Then feel free. Uh, to take your question in the audience chat, which is uh, um, on the screen. So, Dennis, uh, if there's no question from the audience, uh, I have one short question. What do you think uh, is the impact uh, to have uh, the whole family of you uh, within, from the doctor's perspective, um, during the stay or the, the duration of the illness, you mean in the, um, the to have the, your own family members in the intensive care unit? Yes, yes, yes. I think it's ex extremely important, uh, and I was lucky actually to be in a in a hospital uh, in in Brussels that practices very liberal um, visiting hours, uh, and so I was accompanied by. Uh, at least one uh, family member for most of the time throughout my, my stay in the intensive care unit, which was incredibly useful um, and, uh, and helpful and reassuring um, and actually also helped to, um, uh, uh, I, I think, focus uh, attention of the doctors uh, uh, a little bit, get more information um, and views from the doctors in more conversation than you possibly would normally get as a patient who's just lying there in the, in, in the bed. Uh, so I think it's, it creates a dynamic um, in, the, in the hospital room that is different and that actually fosters the mutual understanding of what's actually going on. Okay, thank you. I have another question. Uh, one guest is asking how long uh, did it take until you could go back to work? Yeah, uh, so I was uh, overall in hospital for, uh, a hospital and rehabilitation for eight months. Um, and then uh, I came back home after those eight months and uh, I was lucky enough to have a, uh, a job that allowed me to work from home on the computer starting 
with a couple of hours a day. Um, and then I, I phased back in really over two to three months. Uh, it took until I went to the office really for the first time for a full day of work uh, again. Um, uh, and, and then it took another um, month or so until I really started uh, working more or less full time uh, again. So it's a, it was a very slow um, phase in to work um, throughout this, uh, this uh, stage of the recovery process. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Thank um, you. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, I would go on to the next speaker. Um, I'm appreciate to introduce you Fyodor Iwashina. Um, he is an associate professor of medicine at the University of Michigan and uh, he is internationally recognized uh, for his work to define the problems of survivorship for patients who survive sepsis and the title is uh, Functional Disability After Sepsis. So, uh, Welcome. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. It's an, it's an honor to join the World Sepsis Congress again. Um, I will have the pleasure of speaking with you over the next 10 minutes or so uh, about some of the data about disability after sepsis. I'm going to try not to barrage you with a whole bunch of small numbers, um, but present an approach to thinking about this. Um, I know our slides will all be available, and I would encourage you, if you are on Twitter, to feel free and shoot me a note if you have questions afterwards, if you'd want uh, additional clarification, or if you have a different interpretation of the data and want to help me think in new ways. Um, I also work for the U.S. government, and so I need to say that this does not represent the official use of the U.S. government of the Department of Veterans Affairs. All right, let's get to this meat of the stuff. Um, so I want to start by asking what do we know about the year after sepsis? And what we have here is some data uh, run by Dr. Elizabeth Billianti that looked in three very different healthcare systems in the United States. That looked among people who survived pneumonia, which is the most common cause of sepsis, what happens to them afterwards. The three healthcare systems were the VA, a uh, integrated government provider, Uh, fee-for-service Medicare, which is um, older Americans uh, who have kind of conventional U.S. insurance, or Kaiser Permanente of Northern California, which is a highly integrated uh, private health system. And what they did, is, what she found was that regardless of where you got your health care, about 25 to 30 percent, let's call it a third of people, would die in the year after pneumonia. Um, so these are among people who survived their initial hospitalization for pneumonia and sepsis, uh, but would go on to die in the next year. But also, there's another group, about another third, who would be survived but have multiple hospitalizations. And this seemed to be true regardless of which healthcare system in the United States you were attached to. Uh, and we've come to ask the question of why is that? What's going on with these people that's dry, driving these recurrent healthcare needs? Uh, one bit of data uh, comes from a longstanding longitudinal study of older Americans. And circled in the blue here, you can see we looked at patients uh, one, three, and five years before they would go on to develop sepsis. They were already enrolled in a prospective cohort. And in the blue, we see those patients who had no activities of daily living, no disability before they developed uh, sepsis. And what we found is among those who survived their sepsis hospitalization, those people went on to develop an average of 1.6 new ADL or instrumental activity of daily living, IADL, uh, problems. And that the, that new disability persisted for at least five years afterwards. This is only among survivors. It doesn't include people who died um, and is evidence of a substantial and persistent new disability. So we asked ourselves, how should we think about this? And I think as we started thinking about sepsis, our initial metaphor for sepsis was a lot like an asteroid strike that causes some kind of extinction event. People get hit by sepsis and then they gradually recover or not over years afterwards. Um, 
Indeed, if you look at some of the brilliant uh, data from Zudan Puduchari out of the UK that looks at muscle loss, what you see is that very quickly after people are hospitalized in the ICU, they start losing muscle. And I'm not a uh, cell biologist, but even I can tell that that day one muscle on the left looks well-organized, pink and juicy. And by day seven, they found in these biopsies of people who are still in the ICU, there was substantial disorganization of the muscle fiber. And this metaphor of kind of a hit and then gradual recovery or not, I think resonates with the way many of us who are clinicians experience septic shock. People's blood pressure gets bad, and then either they're able to recover or it stays bad and bad things happen. But as we've tried to dig into this data, we've begun to wonder instead about whether we should think about this as a spiral. We should think about some people who gradually work their way up through recovery or some people who spiral down. And indeed, I need to give Dr. Brian Cutherson and Dr. Hannah Wunsch, both of Toronto, credit for telling me this probably 10 years ago now. It took me a while to realize how right they were. What we've tried to do is unpack this metaphor that Dr. Cutherson and Dr. Wunsch uh, suggested and ask, how is it that these spirals happen? In particular, if we think that most people should recover from sepsis, why is it that they don't? And what can we do? What I'm going to do in the next few slides is take you through that. We tend to think of a pneumonia as leading to disability. And increasingly, I suspect that there's an early vulnerable period, perhaps three to six months, where people get in a self-perpetuating cycle of poor recovery. The components of this cycle may vary person to person, but it seems that some aspect of this cycle is very common and strongly self-reinforcing. So there's a component where people get weak, in part because of that rapid and profound muscle loss that Dr. Puducherry showed us. There's a component where they become anxious and depressed. There's a component where their brain is foggy and they're less able to think clearly and make good decisions. And there's a component where they develop inner current illness. Now, any one of these things could often be overcome by our patients and their substantial reserves and their social support. But instead, what we see is the illness makes you weaker, and the weaker makes you more anxious, and the anxiety and the weakness and the illness make you foggy. And then you're not as compliant with your medicines. Instead, you develop intercardinal illnesses. And you have a cycle then that, even if you break one piece of it, is self-reinforcing. And our challenge then is to ask, what can we do in the hospital to try to break these pieces? And how can we do afterwards to help reinforce them? And let me make some preliminary suggestions. I think the single most important data we have right now about preventing weakness is in the ICU thinking about effective sedation interruption and early mobility. The Society of Critical Care Medicine recently published new clinical practice guidelines for the prevention and management of pain, agitation, sedation, delirium, immobility, and sleep disruption. They are fantastic. They represent a long and sustained process um, that is uh, incredibly rigorous and represents, I think, the best of our imperfect, but the best of our understanding how to go. And then I think a crucial component is we have to make sure patients mobilize themselves when they go home. We need to find ways to help people keep working um, in order to uh, get off the couch and not let further immobility set in. Next, we need to address the anxiety. One part of that uh, is recognizing the profound disruption. As our previous speaker talked about, people not merely are anxious because they've just been ill. They're also anxious because they experience substantial disruptions in their lives, um, that they're not able to go to work. We know uh, from Dr. Dale Needham and others do very high rates of non-return to work. Likewise, there's this incredibly disturbing data from the United States that's found that if you ask patients or their family members after they've been in an ICU for acute hypoxic respiratory failure, how often are you experiencing financial stress as a result of that illness? At least a third and sometimes closer to a half of people were experiencing some substantial financial stress. That interferes not just their own ability to take care of themselves, but I think that probably also interferes with their sense of their ability to meet their own responsibilities and care for the people they love. Importantly, you also see that family members of the people they love are experiencing, of patients are experiencing financial stress, and that this um, 
has assuredly got to propagate throughout the family. At the same time, there's some evidence from the United States, from England, Scotland, and from uh, Australia suggesting that peer support and getting groups together may be an effective strategy to help mitigate parts of the post-intensive care syndrome. That both there is an emotional support component of this, where people are able to help each other and um, understand ways to, and understand that they're not alone, but also pragmatic support to navigate the often Byzantine uh, benefits and social welfare networks and help people work through that. So I think we can both be aware of the financial stresses, the anxiety, but also help provide peer support and communities to help people overcome them. The brain fog is assuredly multifactorial um, and extends long past the periods of delirium. But when we look at data, we know there's one easy win here, which is that we know that lots of ICU and lots of sepsis patients go out on antipsychotics. They're prescribed antipsychotics in the hospital as a result of a well-meaning effort to maintain delir to prevent delirium or to treat their delirium, but then they spend the rest of their months, years, potentially, on high-grade antipsychotics. And stopping those has got to be good for people's brains. At the same time, we also need to remember Mona Hopkins, uh, Dr. Needham, and others' work showing that the reality is the brain bone, as Dale says, is connected to the body bone, that as we prescribe exercise and as we get people moving, it also helps clear their brain. Think of how many of you on this call actually had to go for a run this morning before you felt able to be yourself. I don't think our patients are any different. That we need to have, that as we get their bodies moving, they'll clear their brain. And finally, and I think most amenable to work within you, within the healthcare system, is we need to accept that there are substantial, there's a substantial burden of rehospitalization. And Dr. Prescott, who'll be on later, uh, has really pioneered some of this work to help us understand what are the reasons for which people are rehospitalized? And in particular, Dr. Prescott's shown that there are five that are common and are potentially amenable to better outpatient care. Patients come back after sepsis with new and recurrent infection. That's not a huge surprise. They also come back with congestive heart failure exacerbations. They come back with acute kidney injury, and they come back with COPD exacerbation. They also come back with aspiration pneumonia. And the reality is, for each of these conditions, we know a lot about self-management, and we know about the ways in which an outpatient setting can help advance their care and keep people from getting a second hit. Now, no one patient is going to necessarily experience all of these problems. Recovery is multifaceted, and it's every bit, I think, as multifaceted as resuscitation. No inter one intervention is going to work for all. Instead, I think our challenge as clinicians and as a community is to find the ways to break this cycle for each of our patients and their families. Um, my email address is on the screen. It's tiwashin at umich.edu, or I'm on Twitter far more than uh, my boss would like me to at, at iwashna. I'm happy to take uh, questions now or to continue a conversation afterwards. Uh, and I'd ask our uh, moderator to please open up the floor for questions. Thank you very much, Theodore, for this very interesting uh, paper and talk. Um, I have one question from the audience. Um, the question is, um, if you have an idea what could be the best way to prevent or to treat the cognitive dysfunction after sepsis. Absolutely. So I think our best guess is that delirium plays an important role in that in the ICU. So all of the ongoing work to reduce the iatrogenic, the hospital cause burden of delirium is important. Um, I also think reducing unnecessary sedating medications that we know people go out on and some data was suggested up to 25% of people are discharged from the hospital on a benzodiazepine or an antipsychotic that for which there's not a clear indication. If you don't give people meds that fog their brain, their brain's less likely to be foggy. And then I think the third piece is actively working to ensure people get back into their real life. We know that one of the surprising benefits of early exercise is a reduction of delirium in the hospital. And I would suggest that also early exercise and replaying of people's social roles in the outside life, the reestablishment of real life for them is going to help their brains get back online. But I got to admit, that's all just speculation. 
Okay, thank you very much. I have one more question. Um, you showed us the circle between uh, weakness, anxiety, brain fog, and illness. Um, what do you think um, is the institution in which we should more take uh, effort on on this? Is it the ICU, the post-ICU, or the rehabilitation center? You know, I would suggest that, you know, I think the answer is yes. Uh, precisely all of them, right? We used to ask, is it the emergency department's job to start antibiotics and resuscitation, or is it the ICU's job to start antibiotics and resuscitation? But what we've come to understand is that's a false dichotomy. It's the health system's job to ensure that patients get what they need. And I think, likewise, if it's very easy for each of us to say it's someone else's job. So I would instead ask each of us to ask, what can I do in my piece however incomplete that is, to make it better for the patient? And then how do I advocate for other parts of my health system to also do their piece? Okay, thank you. Here's uh, one more question. Um, uh, you told us about mobilization. Um, what is about uh, the importance of brain training during this, uh, this illness? Yeah, so that's a great question. And uh, Dr. Jim Jackson, who's been doing some of the best work in the world on that, is going to be speaking later in this session. Mm -hmm. So I'll mostly defer to Dr. Jackson. Um, as I read Jim's work, and as I read most of the work that's gone on in Alzheimer's and related dementias as well, I think it's a great idea that has not necessarily panned out yet. And so if some people find it a useful way to get themselves going, by all means, um, I look forward to new and more compelling data on what the best way to do brain training is. Okay, Theodore, thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank okay. you guys so much for having us and joining us. Yeah, and we go on to the next speaker. It's uh, Margaret Herridge from Canada. The, uh, the topic is lessons from studying long-term terms of uh, and outcomes of RVS. Um, Margaret Herridge is Professor of Medicine, um, Critical Care and Respiratory Medicine at the Toronto General Hospital in Canada. And she's an expert of uh, um, RDS. And Margaret, I hope you are on the line and we are very interested in listening to your talk. Thanks so much. Uh, I'm here, and uh, thanks for the kind introduction, and thanks very much to the organizers, and congratulations to everyone on this second uh, World Sepsis Congress and the opportunity to make it accessible to everyone around the world. It's, it's a wonderful opportunity for everyone. Uh, just before I, I talk uh, here and, and uh, speak specifically on lessons from studying long-term outcomes of ARDS, um, I uh, had the pleasure of listening to the tail end of Jack's talk, and I hope that I can follow up on some of the excellent themes that he outlined in terms of an emphasis here on a continuum of care and a reduction in compartmentalization of uh, interventions and really understanding the multimodality um, disabilities that our patients have uh, after sepsis, ARDS, and complex critical illness. I'll start by saying that I don't have any conflicts of interest to declare and talk briefly uh, here in an overview, uh, overview um, uh, what I'm going to speak to today, uh, muscle injury, some functional uh, disability uh, discussion. Um, there's already been some discussion about neuropsychological dysfunction and some caregiver outcomes. And... Um, I'm going to talk uh, initially um, about some landmark work um, by both Sandy Levine and uh, Zudin Puthacheri, part of uh, Nick Hart, Hugh Montgomery, Steve Herridge's, uh, John Moxham's groups. And this uh, really seminal work, uh, uh, Sandy Levine's work on the New England Journal in 2008, showed evidence of important diaphragmatic atrophy and increased proteolysis through an upregulation of the ubiquitin proteasome pathway within hours of mechanical ventilation. And this work was extended by Zud and Puthacheri and JAM in 2013 to show that muscle injury occurs rapidly 
and early and continues relentlessly during the first week of uh, critical illness uh, in sepsis, in ARDS, in other um, entities. And in this very nice review on ICU-acquired weakness by uh, Jesse Hall and J.P. Kress and other work that I've uh, indicated here by um, Robert Stevens and uh, Eddie Fan and others, um, a nice uh, illustration here showing a skeletal, skeletal muscle wasting. It's important to understand that the weakness in critical illness is a combination of a, a myosin depletion myopathy and a neuropathy that's characterized um, by axonal degeneration and axonopathy. And in some of our group's early work, this is some work published by our group uh, back in 2003 in our uh, one-year outcome study in ARDS, the loss of muscle mass uh, as evidenced by a change in weight um, was uh, quite profound in these relatively young survivors of uh, ARDS, and most of the folks in this cohort um, actually had concurrent sepsis. So sepsis was their risk factor for ARDS. So really, here's an intersection of the sepsis ARDS outcomes work here. Um, and uh, this showing the uh, weight loss, as I mentioned, most of which loss of lean muscle mass and that myosin depletion myopathy I mentioned. And showing here in our Toronto ARDS Outcomes Program a proximal muscle weakness that prevented patients from abducting their arm. So this is a 43-year-old uh, woman with community-acquired pneumonia, severe uh, sepsis, ARDS, uh, multiple organ dysfunction, who was unable to abduct her arm here in the pink towel and able to abduct her arm here in the uh, blue gown at one year after ICU discharge, but still complaining of weakness one year later. And we showed in our uh, data set, uh, which was uh, in these very young, very sick ARDS patients, and the robustness of this data subsequently um, validated uh, by Dale Needham and his group. Here are a couple of important publications by, uh, led by Eddie Fan and uh, uh, through the ARDSnet group, um, an outcomes uh, uh, paper led by uh, Dale Needham, um, all replicating the data that we published in 2003, essentially showing a decrease in distance walked in six minutes where at one year, this group of young patients were only able to walk 66% of an age and match controlled population, and this was reflected in a very decrease, um, a, a very important, pardon me, decrement in physical functioning and role physical domains in the SF36, the uh, generic quality of life measure. We did some early muscle biopsy work uh, showing changes of a chronic myopathy um, and uh, this is a case series of work, done, work that was done, um, shown by other groups as well, and uh, an important sequela of the sepsis and ARDS and that legacy of the muscle injury. We followed these ARDS patients out to five years and really showed that beyond one year, of follow-up, there was very little improvement in distance walked in six minutes and also um, the parallel uh, continued decrements in um, the SF36. And again, this work, this five-year outcome data has been um, uh, uh, replicated and extended by uh, different members of Dale Needham's group here, Elizabeth Foe, the first author on this five-year outcomes work from their group, similar findings to our own, showing these are robust findings published in ICM in 2016. I want to make the point, and, and as part of the introduction, echoing what Jack said, that really we're talking about multidimensional functional disability. And although the syndrome, uh, the syndromic construct, this post-intensive care syndrome, has been very helpful in moving the um, understanding of uh, post-critical uh, illness disability forward, there's no question that there's a lot of uh, disability affecting many organ systems and uh, reflecting case complexity acquired after critical illness, including the following. 
some pictures from our own Toronto ARDS program showing uh, non-dependent uh, fibrobullous disease in, a, in the baby lung in patients who are exposed to very high airway pressures, in that case, uh, in a patient on the oscillator. Um, patients who may have tracheal stenosis here on a CAT scan. Patients who have important uh, cosmetic changes. Uh, here's a patient who was volume overloaded and developed diffuse strii that were extremely distressing and contributed to psychological distress. Uh, patients who uh, had heterotopic ossification, this an extra articular bony deposition that can lead to fixed flexion abnormalities and <clears throat> pardon me, functional disability on that basis. Um, Jack's already talked a little bit about neuropsychological disability. I will just uh, tip my hat again to Mona Hopkins, who was the um, first person to really uh, bring this theme out in our literature in ARDS patients, also in sepsis patients, um, showing important uh, decrements across domains of processing speed, memory, executive function, attention and concentration, relative stability and IQ. Uh, seminal papers published in the Blue Journal in 1999 and subsequent follow-up papers also published in the Blue Journal and elsewhere. And the important um, uh, data uh, here led by uh, Pradik Pandurapandi and Wasili uh, and others in their group showing uh, cognitive changes that transcended age and that were on the order of mild Alzheimer type dementia here in these box plots or moderate uh, traumatic brain injury. Finally, I'd like to uh, speak to caregiver outcomes. Of course, the leader in caregiver outcomes has really been Ellie Azoulay. Ellie and uh, uh, the Familia group have contributed the most to caregiver outcomes um, and really have helped put this on the map in terms of depressive symptoms, symptoms of uh, uh, PTSD, anxiety, and many people have explored some of these themes, most notably uh, Chris Cox and others, uh, Terry Huff in some recent uh, publications, most notably um, in Lancet Respiratory, or, or pardon me, in Thorax, very recent publication on the role of mindfulness. I show you here some data um, from a recent um, publication from our Recover Program group. This included all survivors of critical illness, including sepsis, ARDS, and was a national Canadian multi-center cohort study, again reflecting a lot of the early work um, by Ellie and others, showing an impressive burden of depressive symptoms. Here um, at seven days, um, almost 53% of caregivers had moderate to severe depressive symptoms, and although they attenuated out to one year, they were still an impressive proportion at 27%. So to close, I hope that I've persuaded you that sepsis and ARDS patients have important physical disability. Yes, important uh, muscle injury from the myosin depletion myopathy, important neuro, uh, peripheral neuro, uh, neuropathy um, and uh, uh, other um, cognitive issues as well and mood disorders. But further, and to extend the construct of post-intensive care syndrome, which is primarily focused on that, that there are multi-morbidities and multiple uh, um, uh, disabilities uh, resulting in important case complexity and the need for tailored uh, continuum of care interventions. Caregivers, I hope I've persuaded you, are at high risk uh, for mood disorders, and they have continued challenges with mood disorders that may never go away. There are risk groups that have persistent mood disorders, and we know that caregiver burden may be associated with increased mortality. So this becomes a physical health issue, not just a mental health issue. And we need multidimensional outcome measures to capture this kind of multidimensional morbidity, both in patients and caregivers, and novel uh, longitudinal interventions to try to mitigate this. So with that, I'll finish and say thank you very much for the opportunity to share these data and for the privilege to uh, speak uh, today. Thank you so much.
So, Margaret, thank you very much uh, for your talk and for your interesting data. And uh, here's one question from the audience. Uh, the question is, um, do you have an idea how to help the caregivers during this phase? I think that uh, several people have looked at ways to uh, help the caregivers. I think uh, in the ICU, I think if you think about the continuum of care, both for um, patients and family caregivers, and we think about the multi, uh, multiple phases of um, care, um, there are ways that we can intervene directly within the ICU through education for the caregiver. Um, through uh, connectedness to resources, um, through direct uh, offerings of mental health interventions when patient, when the caregivers seem obviously to be um, suffering from depressive uh, symptoms. Um, I think there are way to, ways to help the caregivers as patients transition to the ward, and there's an important literature on anxiety and a burden related to all healthcare transitions for caregivers. So again, an educational intervention, mental health intervention. And through inpatient or outpatient rehab and into the community, other constructs related to uh, the role of navigators, related to education. I just alluded to Chris Cox's recent paper in Thorax on a mindfulness app Uh, where they showed in some pilot data that mindfulness did have an important impact on some of the caregiver mood disorders as well as those of the patient. So I think there are a lot of um, uh, interventions that can be applied across different phases and hopefully create that uh, continuum of intervention and assistance. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Margaret, I have another question. Sure. Um, I'm a neurologist, and um, um, what we have learned in neurology is in stroke patients um, that many of them suffer from post-stroke depression, and mm -hmm. this stroke depression has a bad influence of uh, the neurological outcome after rehabilitation. And we have also seen uh, or learned um, that prescription of uh, antidepressant agent as prophylaxis mm -hmm. um, not also influences uh, a better outcome for depression, but also um, better motoric outcome. Do you think um, that we sh should uh, also study in sepsis patients if uh, prophylactic treatment with um, antidepressant mm -hmm. agent could help them? Well, I think that's a really interesting question. Um, I'm not sure that I know of anyone who's studying that question right now or trying to address that question. Um, I think a lot of the... Um, so, I think that would be a very interesting research question. Um, I think we're really, um, from a neurology standpoint, um, beginning to really understand uh, the structure function relationships and insights from other um, areas of medicine like stroke, um, uh, but also other work um, helping us to understand um, the importance of uh, like neuronal apoptosis in the sepsis in the septic patient and um, how this may, may be uh, an important contributor to age-inappropriate cortical loss and some of the cort uh, cognitive dysfunction that we see. Similarly, in um, groups of patients who are studied um, in detail because of their risk for PTSD, like emergency workers, police, etc., showing that uh, there are lesions or structural lesions in the limbic system. Mm -hmm. And that maybe there are um, important insights there that the mood disorders are a result of limbic system um, uh, disruption or, or uh, injury during an episode of sepsis or critical illness. And at, getting back to your point, maybe there, there are medications um, that may uh, mitigate or attenuate some of the injury that I think we're beginning to understand is really... Uh, an important piece of this global inflammatory response and and compromise of the blood-brain barrier, activation of the microglia, et cetera, which sends 
in motion this more diffuse brain um, inflammatory process that uh, that is is leading to a lot of this, at least in the brain context, uh, disability. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much, Margaret. Um, if there are no any more questions, uh, I would like to go on to the next speaker. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. Mm -hmm. Okay. Next speaker uh, is James Jackson. I introduce him. Uh, he will talk about the role of post-ICU clinics. Uh, James Jackson is from the United States. Uh, he's Associate Professor of Medicine at the Vanderbilt University School in Nashville. And he's one, uh, he's a psychologist and has many much experience of Delirium and cognitive impairment uh, in septic patients, and we are very interested in your talk. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. I'm really delighted um, to be here and to talk about um, ICU recovery uh, in the context of sepsis survivors. Um, so we can proceed here, and, and I'll see how effective I am moving through 23 slides in, in 10 minutes. We're aware that uh, a significant number of people, whether they suffer from sepsis or whether they have been in the ICU more generally, uh, struggle with a condition that has been referred to increasingly as post-intensive care syndrome. Some people use the term post-sepsis syndrome. And um, whatever you call it, it's marked by some commonalities, that is, the existence of significant problems in the cognitive domain, as Margaret was referencing, meaningful problems in the psychiatric domain, which often include post-traumatic stress disorder, and then physical debility of, of different kinds, um, often weakness, deconditioning, uh, things of that sort. Um, not only do these problems exist, but they are also notable for their persistence. Uh, in some cases, they're static. In other cases, they get worse. Uh, in some cases, they get better, although among people who have been profoundly ill in the ICU, especially elders, um, they often don't quite return to their baseline state, whatever that had been. So this constellation of problems we're going to refer to as post-intensive care syndrome, and this constellation of problems to date has often not been treated in North America or Europe or really anywhere around the world in um, in a focused, uh, systematic way, um, there are pockets where people get treatment for post-intensive care syndrome, but uh, that is really more the exception, I think, than the rule. Um, this problem, and I won't belabor it, has been discussed uh, widely in, um, in various uh, media forums. It is increasingly researched and a, a topic of concern. And uh, this problem has been treated via a variety of models of care, and, and some of them are described there, although these are fledgling models, again, as I said, not well developed, not widely used, and not widely studied. Uh, these could include telemedicine-based approaches, group therapy approaches. Um, again, they all hold promise, but what we haven't had yet is a robust survivorship model of treatment in the way that in the cancer realm, for instance, there are cancer survivorship clinics at virtually every cancer center of significance in the world. I read a paper recently that highlighted that there were about 320 cancer survivorships in North America. Um, we may have eight or 10 of them in the United States, so this model is still uh, embryonic and emerging. These post ICU clinics, as I call them, as others call them, engage mental health issues, cognitive impairments, uh, physical impairments, and increasingly engage problems experienced by families who themselves have depression and anxiety and PTSD. And these clinics um, involve or potentially involve people from a range of different disciplines. Um, at Vanderbilt, those disciplines include um, nurse practitioners, physicians, pharmacists, and a neuropsychologist at other places. There are physios and occupational therapists, 
uh, and others, perhaps psychiatrists involved in care. The dilemma here when you're talking about integrating people from different disciplines is a very practical one. That is that um, if you have nine subspecialists that a patient has to see, these very weak and depleted ICU survivors are needing to stay then for a five or six hour appointment so they can see everyone on the team and they're not really wanting to do that. So we're grappling a little bit to try to figure out how to bridge that gap. But there are a lot of people from a lot of disciplines, I think we're increasingly aware, who have a lot to offer to ICU survivors, particularly in the context of integrated care. In the U.S., at least, the model that I'm most familiar with, the approach to care is very fragmented. And often what happens is people leave the ICU and really the only individual they engage with is their general practitioner. If that's a savvy general practitioner, they may ask about mental health and cognitive problems, but that is really the exception rather than the rule. So too often people have pretty significant issues and those are underappreciated and as a result, they're untreated. We've developed um, what we call with, with real humility the Vanderbilt model because we don't have the sense that it is the right model or the best model, it, it's simply our model. And um, as I noted, we have a team of people from different disciplines, pharmacy, critical care, psychology, case management, and we try to include people in our clinic who are the sickest of the sick. Um, this is a little bit of a dilemma for a clinic, that is, who are the patients that you should focus on recognizing that you can't see everyone? I'm going to speed up a bit here, if you don't mind. Um, when you look at um, the patients that we have seen in our clinic, um, for instance, a majority of them have delirium. A uh, majority of them had respiratory failure of some sort. Uh, nearly 70% of them had sepsis. They go to a variety of different discharge destinations. They often don't show up for the clinic, and uh, that's a source of concern for us. We've asked them why. In many cases, it's simply because they feel like they've had too many doctors. In some cases, we can't reach them. In other cases, and I would highlight this, they're not able to travel. An underappreciated consequence of critical illness is problems driving. People are physically debilitated. They're cognitively impaired. Um, you don't want them to be behind the wheel of a car. And importantly, if they are, you don't want to be in the car with them. Um, so this is a problem. We've noted in our clinic that impairments are common. You'll see this cartoon here. Um, fully half of people are not driving. Nearly seven and 10 are cognitively impaired. A majority are not back to work. Unfortunately, too often they are uh, returning to their couch. That's a default behavior, if you will. That is uh, perhaps they've been inactive before and they easily become inactive again. The good news is that often on the heels of a critical illness, people are quite responsive um, to making changes in a way they hadn't been before. And some of the interventions that I think are right to be explored in a critical illness context include cognitive rehabilitation, medication reconciliation. We often find uh, medication errors. Um, nutritional counseling, which leads to weight loss and stop smoking interventions. Uh, there often are people, for instance, who have been smoking their entire lives and the 30 days they were in the ICU represent the longest period of time they've been without a cigarette. So I think that's an ideal time for us to intervene with them. And if we don't, um, they often will return back to the behavior that was problematic for them in the first place. So again, these are pregnant opportunities. Identifying patients for follow-up, again, is a challenge. We often think that individuals with significant delirium and illness severity are uh, ripe for the picking, as they say, but this uh, remains to be seen. That is who the best patients um, for the clinic are. What interventions should be used is also an open question. We're convinced that physical therapy is appropriate. Medication interventions, that is identifying potentially inappropriate and actually inappropriate medications is important. Smoking cessation is something we've had some success with here at Vanderbilt. And weight loss is another. Uh, many of our patients will joke about what they call the ICU diet. They'll refer to it as the hardest, most expensive diet they've ever been on. 
but often they've lost 50 pounds or 80 or even 100 pounds. They didn't lose it the right way. They've lost a lot of muscle. But some of them say that they are lighter and uh, they are actually able to move around better because they've lost this weight. So that's something that we need to build on. Cognitive rehabilitation, uh, we believe, has some promise as this pharmacological therapy. Education is important. This is simple and old-fashioned, but it's hard to overstate the importance of explaining to people in particular um, what it is to expect. Uh, what it is they should be expecting in upcoming months because education is really power. And uh, the more we can help them to calibrate expectations, the better off they do. Our patients have found a number of things to be very helpful. Uh, the most helpful, according to them, is simply talking in a candid way with one of us in the clinic and receiving a detailed explanation of the problems they're having and what to expect. Um, I give them memory tests. They're mixed a little bit about how much they like those. We refer them to other services, and I think that's been helpful. We have a number of ICU collaboratives through the Society of Critical Care Medicine, and these are spreading through the world. We're optimistic that uh, although we need to study this phenomenon, ICU recovery centers better, um, there is a lot of energy that is increasingly being directed at this topic, and uh, I think that's a really good development. There are a number of next steps. Uh, what are those? Those include continued education and awareness about post-intensive care syndrome. Again, we could refer to it as post-sepsis syndrome. The need to develop uh, robust post-intensive care syndrome screening tools, which perhaps could be disease-specific. The need to develop uniform approaches to assessment. Testing and implementing ICU recovery frameworks, in particular peer support approaches, we have a support group we've had at Vanderbilt here for some time, and it's been a, a really beautiful sight to behold to see these patients support each other. And um, again, to take the insights we learn from these patients and to feed it back to quality improvement in our ICU and our ward. So I thank you for the time. I apologize for going over by, I think, two minutes. But um, this is an important topic in, in my view to talk about, and I'm happy to engage any questions if people have them. I would like you to ask a similar ask in, as a question as I asked uh, Margaret. Um, do you have experience with the early assessment uh, to uh, for post-intensive care unit syndrome on the ICU, or in other hands, or in other words, uh, do you have experiences uh, with prophylactic description of antidepressant agents to prevent? depression or anxiety and um, sepsis survivors? It's a good question, and, and I appreciated you asking Margaret, and I appreciated her, her characteristically thoughtful answer. Um, we typically haven't, um, in, a, in a systematic way, used um, antidepressants prophylactically, although I, I'm, I'm not opposed to that necessarily. Um, I, I think our dilemma, and frankly, I think the challenge is that um, sometimes it is not exactly clear for some time what the outcomes are going to be in patients when they leave the ICU. Now, that is, a fair number of them leave the ICU depressed, it's true, but, but many of them are in a situation where things are shifting pretty quickly depending on how their recovery occurs. So there are people we see one week after the ICU at our clinic who seem quite depressed and they are, for whatever reason, on a very fast recovery track and a month later um, are, are really quite encouraged. So even though they look depressed at time point A, by time point B, they're really not. Equally, we see people who don't seem to be particularly depressed when we see them and when they return home, it's only then that they understand how profound their limitations are and they become quite depressed. So, so our dilemma, if it makes sense, is trying on the one hand to be very, very proactive with these patients, but on the other hand, um, trying not to be too prescriptive with them because in the first month or two after discharge, things shift a lot. So this is really one of the dilemmas. That is, um, when you evaluate people in the early days after the ICU and you see 
cognitive and mental health symptoms, how do you engage them? What does it mean not to underreact to those? And what does it mean not to overreact to those? We're continuing to work on that, if that makes sense. Okay. Thank you very much, James. There are no more questions from the audience, and I would like to go on to the next speaker. Um, unfortunately, uh, Wesley Alley is not in the room, but uh, he has pre-recorded his talk, and the title of the talk is Prevention of Post-Sepsis Consequences. And Dr. Wesley Ailey is a professor of medicine in the Division of Allergy, Pulmonary, and Clinical Care Medicine at the Vanderbilt University School. And he has focused on improving the care of outcomes of critical age patients with ICU-acquired brain diseases. And we are very interested in this talk. Unfortunately, we are not able to uh, have uh, questions to him because he's not in the room. So then we let's see the talk. Hi, this is Wes Ely, and I'm very thankful to be able to present to the World Sepsis Congress today on post-intensive care syndrome and acquired dementia, prevention of post-sepsis sequelae. On this first slide, I just want to disclose that I've received honoraria for CME events, educational events, that were sponsored by Abbott, Pfizer, and Orion. I'm also federally funded in the United States by the National Institute of Health and the VA. I wanted to go over with you today three main studies, the first of which will talk about this issue of post-sepsis dementia or an acquired dementia. Uh, the second will be an approach, a bundled approach, to managing patients in the ICU better with uh, multiple New England Journal, JAMA, and Lancet articles being put together into a ICU-acquired bundle, ICU bundle called the ABCDEFs, or ICU liberation. And the third will be related to drug-induced delirium, so sedative-induced delirium that we cause as part of a, the demise of our patients. And so we're going to go through over those three topics today. The first topic, the data come from our brain ICU study. In this investigation, which we published in the New England Journal of Medicine, we found that ICU patients who were on mechanical ventilation and or septic shock had a profound drop in their cognitive function three months to 12 months later. You can see here at, on the top column, whether you are above 65 or below 65, that these patients were nowhere near the normal or even mild cognitive impairment range on the median and interquartile range uh, responses at three and 12 months afterwards. We're calling this a post-ICU dementia because the vast majority of these patients didn't have dementia. Only 6% had any notable cognitive impairment on the front end of their ICU stay, and yet they landed down here around traumatic brain injury and Alzheimer's disease in terms of function. We were surprised, even on the far left of this slide, that people who were less than 50 also had this problem. So not a good situation even for the youngsters. And delirium was the strongest predictor of the acquisition of this acquired dementia. So anything we can do to prevent delirium might be able to help prevent this post-sepsis sequelae of a, of a dementia. One of the things we have accrued over the past 15, 20 years in critical care are great data in the area of assessing and preventing and managing pain, doing spontaneous awakening and spontaneous breathing trials, choice of sedation, delirium assessment prevention and management, early mobility, and then family engagement. And these things are outlined nicely on different websites. You can see the icudelirium.org website or iculiberation.org website. Hospitals all over the United States got together in an SCCM approach and implemented this bundle, this A2F bundle, across these different types of community, government, academic hospitals. The outline of how we did this is on our icudelirium.org website. You can see these gold buttons here, A, B, C, D, E, F. And this is a place you could go and download free materials, protocols, and learn the way that we approach this. 
The data behind this A2F bundle are really very robust. I've just collated four or 500 articles for you and sifted out of them just the JAMA, Lancet, and New England Journal papers. And you can see those outlined here for the SATs and SBTs, the choices of sedation and analgesia, uh, the D, the delirium piece, there's JAMA and Lancet papers, early mobility, very robust JAMA New England. And then as you go to the family engagement and picks, you can see similar stories here. So these articles are just provided to you so that you can pull the original literature. Um, the first study of this entire bundle was by Michelle Ballas and she showed in a one and a half year study of 300 patients that you could improve in the gray there the days alive and off of mechanical ventilation you could decrease delirium increase early mobility with the bundle and decrease death uh, it was very interesting though that this was followed up by a multi-center study six hospitals in the california area over 6,000 patients and uh, excuse me, seven hospitals. And in these, this study of over 7,000 patients, you can see that on the X and Y axis of these two graphs published by Marianne Barnes Daly in Critical Care Medicine in 2017, that you've got an improvement in hospital survival on the Y axis as you go up in the compliance rates with the bundle across the X axis. And again, that's 6,064 patients. You can see the odds ratio of 1.15, which is a 15% improvement in survival for every 10% improvement in compliance with the bundle. Go across to delirium and coma freedom, and you can see that you get more, more patients alive and free of delirium and coma as you go up in compliance with the bundle as well. And this is after adjusting for severity of illness age and mechanical ventilation in these seven hospitals in California. So what we have are two pictures here showing that back in the 70s, we were walking people on the ventilator. In the 80s and 90s and early 2000s, we didn't do that. We immobilized our patients. We sedated them into the Stone Age, and there was a lot of acquisition of muscle and nerve disease, ICU-acquired weakness. Now you can see that despite all of this advance in technology and all these things this patient has to be transported with, we have patients walking in the ICU in 2015, and this is the, the approach of the ABCDEF bundle. It doesn't take fancy equipment, though. Here's a wonderful picture, courtesy of Kasia Kotfus from Poland, of her patient walking with a grocery cart and just the ventilator and everything shoved into the grocery cart so you don't have to have fancy equipment you can see this is such a human way a humane way of approaching patient care here with her husband there with her as she's intubated not able to pass an SBT and yet able to walk in the unit to prevent herself from getting ICU acquired weakness and then the third patient the third study that I want to cover is one we published in Lancet last year Tim Gerard first author and our group from Vanderbilt University did this investigation where we looked at delirium and we divided it up into hypoxic septic sedative associated and metabolic delirium the definitions are there in the Lancet respiratory paper and you can see in this in this graph here that you know within hypoxic you also have some sedative and septic etc and as you go across the, these, these what we call mountain graphs, um, we are not pretending that we were able to divide patients all into septic or all into sedative induced. But what we did do was we said, if we do a multivariable analysis of the types of delirium they've got and try and adjust for other covariates, is there a signal that that specific etiology of delirium within the patient population was contributing to a long-term cognitive dysfunction. And so this is really the take-home slide. As you look at the first three, especially hypoxic, septic, and sedative associated, you can see that there is a drop. Just look at the blue lines. The blue lines is at 12 months after the ICU, did delirium duration on the x-axis of that type of delirium. So go to the third graph, for example. Did one, two, three, four days of sedative-associated delirium predict the acquisition 
of global cognitive dysfunction in, in terms of dementia. And you can see that there was a steep drop according to the amount of delirium you had on the x-axis and then the amount at one year of cognitive dysfunction you had from baseline. And uh, this is really a striking uh, finding for us to, to, to consider that we as clinicians, doctors, nurses, PharmDs, etc., might be contributing to the acquisition of this dementia by giving patients too much in the way of sedation, analgesia that contributes to their delirium. Clearly, if somebody is in pain, you're going to want to give them pain medicines and control that pain, but it could be that we often give too much pain medication even beyond just controlling the pain and that and or you name it your favorite sedative of the day might be contributing to uh, to this problem of, of an acquired dementia that goes on for over a year after critical illness and what you see on this last slide is that uh, if you if you look at uh, these different types of delirium that um, the sedative associated was really actually one of the most striking and uh, and one of the most deleterious ones in the entire cohort. There's another graph in the study which shows you that as well. And we concluded that we should consider sedative associated hypoxic and septic delirium indicators of acute brain injury and identify all potential risk factors that may impact on post-ICU dementia, especially those iatrogenic and potentially modifiable risk factors such as overuse of sedation. So uh, I will close with this one mnemonic which helps us think through what is it that we will do when we are at the bedside and we diagnose delirium in the ICU and we, we think about the Dr. Dre. So our nurses say Dr. Ely, Dr. West, our patient is CAM ICU positive today. They have brain dysfunction. So in addition to sepsis and, and uh, shock and, and ARDS, our patient's brain is down. What will we do about that? And we say, well, let's think about DDRE, disease remediation, drug removal, and environment. None of this is adding a new drug. We're th simply thinking about taking care of the underlying diseases, removing potentially offensive psychoactive drugs, and then environmental things like uh, getting rid of immobilization, getting the patient active and walking, as we discussed earlier, sleep-wake cycles restored, eyeglasses, hearing aids, and of course, family involvement, because family involvement in a recent Brazilian study in critical care medicine actually reduced delirium, much like immobilization reduced delirium. Uh, this is our part of our research group here at Vanderbilt University. It's been my privilege to present to you today at the World Sepsis um, Educational Program. And I want to thank Conrad Reinhardt and everybody else who has organized this fabulous educational mission. Uh, it's my privilege to have presented to you. And please let us know through the icudelirium.org website if our group can be of any benefit, any help to you at your institution. Thank you so much. Thank Wesley Ailey for his pre-recorded talk and we go on in the session with the last speaker. It's Haley Prescott. She's from the United States. Uh, she worked as an ICU doctor and researcher at the University of Michigan and Ann Arbor. And uh, her, her research focuses on sepsis and survivorship and her studies have highlighted the role of specific treatable medical conditions in driving post-sepsis mobility. And so the title of the talk is Strategies for Enhancing Recovery, What Works? We are very interested, Haley. Excellent. Well, thank you for the uh, introduction and also um, to the organizers for the invitation to present. It's really an honor to present in this um, second uh, World Sepsis Congress and also to really sort of, you know, really try to summarize and bring together this excellent session today that we've had on enhancing recovery from sepsis. Um, we know from the most recent estimates that about 14 million patients around the world every year survive a hospitalization for sepsis. Uh, but unfortunately, many of these patients go on to experience poor longer-term outcomes that we've heard about today from the other speakers. Um, there's about a three-fold increase in cognitive impairment following a sepsis hospitalization. Patients acquire on average one to two new functional limitations. There's a very high rate of hospital readmission, about 40% uh, within the first three months. 
And also about one in five patients who survive sepsis hospitalization goes on to have a late death, a death in the next one to two years that's not explained by their age or their comorbidities, but rather seems to be driven by these lasting consequences um, of a sepsis hospitalization. Our current um, clinical practice guidelines for sepsis, the Surviving Sepsis Campaign Guidelines, provide excellent guidance on this sort of early management of sepsis, the golden hours, the first six hours after patients come to the hospital, but they don't focus much on the post-hospital management or, or what to do around the time of hospital discharge. Um, and so I'll be talking uh, more holistically today about what we can do to promote recovery um, throughout the course of the patient's care, starting from the very early uh, presentation to the hospital with sepsis, through hospitalization to discharge, and what to do in the outpatient follow-up setting. And so um, this um, sort of talk today will really highlight um, the recommendations that come from this um, paper, Enhancing Recovery After Sepsis. This is a review article that I uh, wrote with Derek Angus, which was published in JAMA earlier this year. Um, and so I'll focus on three different things, early hospital care, what to do at the time of hospital discharge, and early outpatient follow-up. Uh, so starting off with the early hospital care, I think it really all starts out with um, good uh, basic sepsis care. So timely antibiotics, source control, and resuscitation. We had two big uh, sort of large observational studies that were published last year, uh, one in New England Journal of Medicine looking at data from New York State, another published in the Blue Journal looking at data from Kaiser Permanente, and both of these studies really showed the same thing, um, that any delays in antibiotics, even delays on the, hour, um, the order of an hour or two hours, um, uh, increase the chance of um, in-hospital mortality. Um, and uh, there was a, a, res oops, a study that was published in uh, Lancet Respiratory Medicine, uh, the FANTASY trial, that looked at pre-hospital antibiotics. So trying to move up time zero even before the hospital when the patient is in the ambulance and route to the hospital. And, and this study, um, being a, a randomized clinical trial, was smaller than these sort of very large observational studies and also uh, enrolled patients that were a little bit less ill. Um, so in hospital, our 30-day survival was about... Um, uh, over 90%. And so they didn't find, uh, they weren't able to sort of replicate this um, benefit in terms of time to antibiotics. Um, there was no difference in mortality. And that's, again, probably just because of the smaller sample size and because of the somewhat less ill population. But intriguingly, they found that the patients who had antibiotics in the ambulance and route to the hospital about 90 minutes sooner than the usual care arm actually had a reduced rate of hospital readmission. This suggests to me that this time to antibiotics, you know, not not only matters for in-hospital survival, but it may actually help in terms of mitigating some of these long-term sequelae, and in particular, this increased rate of recurrent infections that we see in our patients. Uh, so first thing that we want to focus on is timely antibiotics, source control, and resuscitation. Uh, second thing for early hospital care, and this has really been highlighted very well by Wesley Lee before me, is the importance of managing pain agitation, and delirium, trying to avoid iatrogenic complications in the hospital. Uh, we're very fortunate to have excellent clinical practice guidelines for the prevention and management of pain, agitation, sedation, delirium, immobility, and sleep, which were just uh, updated and released in critical care medicine this month. Um, and so I would say this is the second sort of core component of caring for sepsis is trying to attend to these things and prevent further iatrogenic complications. Uh, this is very important. Now, Wes talked about about the relationship between acute delirium and uh, cognitive impairment in survivors, there's also an association between delirium and post-acute mortality. This is a study here that was published, uh, first author is Schuller, it was published in Critical Care Medicine earlier this year, and they looked at uh, organ dysfunction during the acute hospitalization and tried to say which organ dysfunction is most closely associated with late death, so death after surviving the initial sepsis hospitalization. And far and away, they found that neurologic dysfunction, so delirium, coma, during the hospitalization was most closely associated with late deaths among patients who initially survived the sepsis hospitalization. So just yet another study showing how important delirium management is. The third important thing to focus on during this early hospital care is early mobility. Um, I have a figure here from the uh, study by Schweikert in Lancet from 2009. This was a study that looked at an early mobilization intervention, so randomizing patients to get them up and working with physical therapy, doing weight-bearing exercises, standing, even uh, some of these patients walking while still on mechanical ventilation. And this really had a profound effect. So there was... Um, 
you know, over 20% absolute increase in the rate of return to independent functional status at hospital discharge. Um, in addition, the duration of delirium was reduced by about two days. And we've just heard about how important delirium is in terms of subsequent cognitive impairment and also um, late mortality. And here we have an intervention that has been shown consistently to reduce the duration of delirium. So I think the third sort of key component to focus on early in the hospital stay is getting patients up and walking. Next, I will move on to talk about what to do sort of after this initial phase of sepsis when we start to prepare our patients to go home from the hospital. We spend a lot of time, and it's very important to get antibiotics uh, on quickly to resuscitate our patients. Uh, and increasingly, as I work in the ICU, I spend more time thinking about the de-resuscitation. So when is it the right time to stop antibiotics, and how do we get off the fluid off of the patients to target their dry weight? Uh, why is this important? So um, there's a study from the... Um, uh, Jim Baggs is the first author, and it's in uh, Clinical Infectious Disease earlier this year. They looked at the association of antibiotics and subsequent sepsis hospitalizations, and they find that the more sort of antibiotics a patient has been exposed to, the higher the risk of subsequent sepsis. So, you know, we want to get the antibiotics on quickly. We want to treat people with broad-spectrum antibiotics to treat the cause. Um, but then as soon as a patient is getting better, we want to peel those antibiotics off and stop them as soon as possible, not only to reduce the global burden of antimicrobial resistance, but also to limit the harm that we do to a patient's microbiome, which is really important to trying to fend off uh, subsequent infection and subsequent sepsis. Uh, the SAP study, the study uh, by first author is Dijong and published in Lancet ID in 2016, looked at the safety and efficacy of procalcitonin as a biomarker to try to tailor the duration of antibiotics. And they found that this uh, biomarker was helpful in terms of reducing the duration of antibiotics in critically ill patients and also that the patients that were treated and had their antibiotics limited based on the procalcitonin uh, also had reduced mortality. So really suggesting that it's a safe an effective way to limit antibiotics, and that actually limiting the duration of antibiotics may improve longer-term outcomes and mortality for our patients. The second component of this sort of de-resuscitation is getting off the fluid that we gave people initially to resuscitate them. Uh, in a study by Christina Mitchell published in Annals of ATS back in 2015, they looked at a, um, a cohort of several hundred patients hospitalized with septic shock and found that uh, about 85% of patients have a positive fluid balance at the time of ICU discharge. Uh, about a third of them are frankly volume overloaded, meaning that their weight is more than 10% above what it was on admission to the hospital. Less than half of those patients had ever received diuretics. Uh, and importantly, this, this frank volume overload, these people whose body weight is more than 10% greater than admission, were more than twice as likely to be unable to ambulate at hospital discharge, even after adjusting for critical illness. Uh, and they were much more likely to be discharged to nursing facilities or post-acute care facilities, suggesting that this excess weight that patients are left with at the end of the hospitalization really has profound impacts for people's ability to go home and walk and their ability to go home at all versus going home to a facility. So I think it's very important to focus on trying to remove this fluid towards the end of the hospitalization. If people aren't doing this themselves with good urine output, that we should give them diuretics to promote this. Um, and it's also important to be aware, we've talked uh, earlier in this session about weight loss. And so often I think that not just getting people back to their dry weight, we probably need to get them even less than their dry, their dry weight or what they were on admission to the hospital, recognizing that there's been muscle loss over the course of the hospitalization. All right, moving on. Next thing to focus on towards discharge, again, this is a theme that's been picked up um, several times here, is medication reconciliation and titration. There have been many studies suggesting that chronic medications are often discontinued on accident, acute medications, things like antipsychotics, antidepressants, benzodiazepines that were started sort of temporarily to treat symptoms in the ICU are often continued indefinitely, and this is really problematic for patients. So it's really important to reconcile medications and to titrate these medications at ICU discharge, at hospital discharge, and in early outpatient follow-up. To really sort of bring home how important this is, I will uh, mention this study that was published in JAMA Internal Medicine earlier this year, the effect of an in-hospital multifaceted clinical pharmacist intervention on risk of readmission. So this study was a multicentral clinical trial looking at patients discharged from hospital on at least five prescription medications. And they randomized people to this complex intervention where they did a, a review of the medications by the clinical pharmacist. 
They did motivational interviews on several different sessions with each patient to ensure that the patients really understood every medicine that they were on, uh, which ones needed to be titrated, why they were taking them. And then they called all the other providers, the outpatient primary care doc, the nursing home physician, to make sure everyone was on the same page. And this complex intervention had a really uh, impressive impact, 23% risk reduction for this composite outcome of ER visits and rehospitalization, really bringing home how important these medications are um, at the end of a critical illness. Next thing to focus on towards discharge is counseling and preparing patients for what to expect. Uh, this, um, uh, in 2014, there was a survey that went out to ICUs across the state of Michigan, and clinicians were asked, do medical teams in your ICU have formal discussions with patients or family members regarding challenges or changes to their lights after ICU discharge? And about a third say, almost never, we really don't do that. A third said, well, some people do, it varies widely. And only about a third say that they consistently have these conversations. And I think this is really low-hanging fruit about things we can do today. I've uh, collected some quotes from patients over the years to sort of bring home how important this counseling and anticipatory guidance is. One patient says, when you don't tell me what to expect, I feel defeated every time I can't do something. So when I go home and can't do something and no one's told me to expect this, people feel like a personal failure. Uh, the second quote from the patient, which I hear all the time, my, my family, my doctor, everyone thinks I'm okay. They tell me it's in my head, but I don't feel right. This just really shows how important it is to validate how common these challenges are uh, and that people aren't alone. Um, the third quote, again, something I hear all the time, no one told me I was going to be short of breath. I've been sitting in my chair waiting for the shortness of breath to get better. People go home and they have struggles because of deconditioning, because of muscle loss. It's harder to do the things that they used to do. They have shortness of breath. They have pain. And a lot of patients assume that it's not safe to be active. And so they sit and wait to get better. And that's not a recipe to recover. We need people to be working each day to get stronger and to do more than they were doing the day before. So now I'll talk about what to do in early outpatient follow-up. So really picking up on this last quote, we want to promote functional recovery. We want to screen patients for functional impairments, difficulty doing what they used to do. And we want to um, address this and sort of stratify people in terms of what they need. Some people merely need uh, a talk, um, explanation that it's safe uh, to move, and a structured exercise program they can do themselves. People with more profound disabilities and limitations will benefit from physical therapy, occupational therapy, and people with severe underlying cardiac or pulmonary um, comorbidities may benefit from cardiac or pulmonary rehabilitation, but everybody needs some kind of recipe to promote recovery, uh, functional recovery after sepsis hospitalization. Next thing, uh, we've talked about hospital readmissions, incredibly common in patients after sepsis. This really can derail recovery, and we want to do everything we can to avoid a second hit. By far, the most common potentially preventable reasons to bring people back to the hospital are recurrent infections, heart failure exacerbations, acute kidney injury, COPD exacerbation, and aspiration. So when I discharge people from the hospital, when I'm reconciling these medications, this is what we really want to focus on, making sure that we have people on optical medical management to control their volume, to treat their heart failure, to you know adjust medications for any new mild kidney injury so that these medications don't build up and cause more problems down the road. This is an opportunity to make sure patients are vaccinated, they're on the optimal therapy for COPD. Um, this is an opportunity to counsel people about the risk for recurrent infection to make sure that they call in to be evaluated if they're experiencing uh, new signs or symptoms of infection in the early post-hospital setting. The last thing, which again has come up earlier today, is peer support. So peer support makes a ton of sense. We hear really good stories coming out of the Thrive Network of in-person in peer support groups. Uh, Inspire, which is a post-ICU uh, program that really uh, incorporates peer support, which is being run out of Scotland. Um, this is a great opportunity for patients to give and receive pragmatic advice, to give and receive emotional support. Um, there hasn't been a ton of sort of formal evaluation of this, but we hear you know, overwhelmingly good responses from patients and it makes a lot of sense. And I think it's something that we should invest in going forward. Um, so I will just put up my closing slide with my top recommendations for early hospital care towards discharge and after discharge. I'd like to thank everyone for being here and for the opportunity to um, um, give this talk. I'm happy to take questions. I've also put my Twitter handle up here and I'm happy to field questions via Twitter as well. Thank you. So, Heidi, thank you very much for this very comprehensive overview. <laughs> uh, if there are uh, any questions in the audience, uh, feel free to send them to us via this uh, 
public audience chat. At the moment, there are no questions. Uh, but Haley, uh, can you uh, give us uh, a short answer about um, the role of um, malnutrition and outcome in particular patients? I missed this. Um, yeah, no, I, th I think malnutrition is a huge, I always am sort of struggle to, what can you condense down into 10 minutes? And, you know, you're always leaving something out when you talk about the most important things. But you're absolutely right. I mean, nutrition is huge. I mean, um, Jim, you know, Margaret mentioned just um, in her studies, the overwhelming amount of weight loss that people experience after critical illness. Jim mentioned seeing a lot of this too in their post-ICU clinic. We see a lot of people lose weight. In some instances, this is opportunity. But for a lot of patients, this is not the type of weight loss that we want. They're really losing muscle mass um, and sort of this is I think a particularly important time to sort of do all the right things you know get enough sleep get enough exercise sort of focus on eating the right foods all the things that we should be doing all the time anyway um, I think that these are sort of particularly important during this very vulnerable time this aftermath of sepsis where we feel like if we can get people on the sort of right trajectory they'll have a much better recovery um, if we can sort of start doing those things and keep people out of the hospital um, during the first you know weeks and months after discharge mm -hmm. thank you very much uh, here's one from the audience I think it's uh not easy uh, to answer, but you can try it. The question is, uh, what do you think is the most important thing? Oh, gosh, the most In important thing. Recovery. <laughs> In enhancing recovery. Yeah, man, that is a really hard thing. I would say in terms of like opportunities that are low-hanging fruit that I think that we're not doing a good enough job at. You know, I think there already is a lot of attention to timely antibiotics. Of course, this is important, but a lot of people are focusing a lot of effort on that. I think the sort of low-hanging fruit and the thing that we're not doing well right now is preparing people. I, I've, I've received emails over and over again from patients saying, why did no one tell me this was going to happen? Uh, or patients telling me, you know, again, I feel short of breath and I'm just sort of scared to do anything. You know, I didn't know to expect this. And they just, people, people don't, they don't assume that this is what's going to happen. They assume as long as I get to the hospital, I'll go back to how I was before. And so when they go home and they face all these struggles, it's really um, sort of, it, it sort of just adds more emotional toll um, to already sort of a challenging time. So I think, you know, it's hard to sort of limit what is the most important thing. You know, I've tried to highlight what I think are sort of a, a collection of most important things, but in terms of sort of areas of opportunity or areas we can do better, I think it's really trying to counsel patients um, about what to expect and probably trying to coordinate care across, you know, the ICU, the hospital ward, the nursing facility, and the outpatient care. I think fragmentation is one of the current challenges as well. Okay. Uh, one last question. We are, have Great. two minutes sure. more time. Um, the question is, um, what do you think is better, to put all ICU through, uh, all septic patients in one ICU, or should we focus on the diseases, for example? transplant traumatic brain injury also. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think that, you know, sepsis is just such an overwhelmingly common condition, um, and a lot of people are at risk for it. So people are at increased risk for it after surgeries, they're at increased risk for it if they're a transplant patient or, you know, are immunosuppressed, people with cancer are at risk for it. And so I, you know, I think it's something that probably needs to be a core component across all types of ICUs, um, and it's going to be hard to localize all sepsis people to one ICU. That's just sort of my, you know, sort of personal feeling about it is that it's just such a common thing that we need to, you know, invest in competency across the hospital, in the ER, and across all ICUs. Okay. So, thank you very much for this excellent talk. Um, um, I would like to close the session now. Um, I would like to thank uh, all the speakers. I would like to thank the audience uh, that was in the session. And I would like to invite the audience to visit our website. Um, and I would like also to invite the audience uh, to sign the World Sepsis Declaration and to follow us uh, on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Um, as you can see here or on this slide. And last but not least, I would like to thank uh, the organizers of this uh, Congress. And I would like to send uh, all the sponsors of this Congress, and I would like to say goodbye to everyone.